Hi, hello. My name is Julia Thomas and um, I work as a theatre director. I've been really lucky over the years to direct some productions at Curve in Leicester. And um, I'm really excited to share with you some thoughts and ideas on the way that I work and maybe give you some useful tools that you could use yourself when you're looking at plays, texts, improvising or devising work in the future. So the thing I'm going to share with you today is something that I might use with actors. So when we're kind of looking at creating characters or developing our understanding of what's happening in the play or in scenes. But it is also something that I use with writers as well. So something that might be useful when we're thinking about how we begin creating new stories, new ideas, and how we take those things from our imagination and put them into the written text or the spoken text. So hopefully it'll be quite useful for you today and I'm really looking forward to sharing it with you. So I refer to this thing as play archaeology. Now I always wanted to be an archaeologist and um, I thought it was the coolest thing uh, to be someone who's discovering things but I also really love plays and the way I look at um, you know when I look at plays I always feel like I'm an archaeologist and that I'm undigging things and unearthing hidden gems so there's something within a play that is is buried perhaps and we have to find them now why do we have to find them well I think quite often as a director it's my job to make just about anything interesting so let's try and get a bit more of an understanding of um, what I mean by play archaeology to get us started. So what I mean by this is a play is, well, it's a story that you experience through the senses about what it means to be human. Now, this story could enlighten, it could entertain, it could question, challenge, surprise, provoke, soothe, sadden. And it basically does anything that humans can do. So a play is the human experience. It's what we share. It's a ritual that is really, really very precious to us as human beings. And it's the story of us, really, which I think is what's always so important. And the other thing that's really key here is the use of the senses and all of them for different reasons or so different times. Now, what I mean by archaeology in this instance and how this might relate to the play is this is the excavating and understanding of artifacts that help us to describe how other humans live in similar or different times and spaces to our own. So when you put them together, what we're doing is unearthing what it means to be human. And maybe sometimes they're things that we recognize because we have a similar experience. But what's really important about the archeology span of it is that sometimes we're able to think differently um, to find a way into understanding how another person may, may live. So this always sounds so much more interesting than text analysis, which sounds super boring, but play archeology, span now that sounds like something that could be quite interesting. So I'm gonna take you through this so that you can really think about what that means for you. But before you get any of, just move myself there so you can see this, before you get any of this equipment out, you can see there we've got a shovel, got some sort of pick thing, we've got a bucket, very important to have a bucket. Before you get any of that stuff out, I need you to know one important thing. And that is, that you have most of the tools that you need already. So it's within you. When we look at play archeology, span I'm not asking you to uh, go beyond what you already know. I'm asking you to look inside of yourself and use what you already have in order to do that. And there is one really, really important tool that I'm gonna share with you in a moment. But I guess the question is, is, so what are you excavating then? You've got the tools. What exactly are you trying to find? Now, 
the thing that you're finding is the crux of all of this. It's the thing that really, really is, it's almost like my secret weapon as a director. Um, it's the thing that I, I hold my, keep in my pocket at all times. The thing I know that if a scene isn't working, if someone is finding something difficult, um, if maybe the story just isn't making sense or worst case scenario, it just feels really, really dull. Then I look for and I excavate this and it's the event. And the event is something happens, simple as. Now, that something might feel a little bit like this. Fireworks, explosive, quite amazing. You know, it's the thing, you can see all these people there, they're kind of up and, you know, moving their arms up and down, super excited about the event. But it doesn't always have to be like fireworks. Sometimes it can be quieter than that. Sometimes an event can be something that um, isn't necessarily explosive, it's just simmering under the surface. So we all have different ideas about what an event might be. Uh, for example, we have world events. So these are things that happen, you know, across the world. They're these big things that we might read about or we might um, hear about or we watch the news and we see that there are world events happening all of the time. So what do you think about when you think about world events? What comes into your mind? Well, some examples I've got are Gangnam Style reaching a billion YouTube views. That was a bit of an event, 2012. We've got the moon landings. So this is pretty exciting as well. So that this might be something that maybe, um, obviously you were too young to see for yourselves. Um, I remember speaking to my family members who were watching on the television and it was a really huge event at the time. Um, but it's definitely something that's significant in the world, something that we might know about or we might have studied. Um, and then we have this one, which is more recent. So this is something that maybe you yourselves might have been part of. So the school strikes and we have Greta Thunberg here, you know, sitting down every, every day, every, every Friday um, to protest about climate change and to have her voice heard. Um, and that's a really kind of quite amazing event because it's something that is um, happening regularly. So it's not just something that happened once, but it's an event that leads to a movement. So and an ideology and a way of thinking. So world events can be all sorts of things. And I'm sure you've got your own examples of what how a world event feels. And then we have what I'm calling life events. So what do you think of when you think about life events? Um, now, they could be birthdays or they could be parties, they could be the first time you ever ate something that was absolutely delicious, or maybe it's going to see a film in the cinema. Have a think about your own life events. What would you class are yours? They're not the thing that's happening in the world. They're very, very personal to you. So what do you think of when you think about life events? Now, here's some of my life events, just to get you thinking. That's me in a volcano. Pretty exciting, but even more exciting because I'm really petrified of the dark and I really hate enclosed spaces. So behind me in that photograph, you can see that there's a kind of, um, there's a lift and it goes up the, the volcano shaft. So you go in the top of the volcano, you go down the lift and you end up inside it. And it's so beautiful inside. But it was an event for me something was happening for me that was not just about going in the volcano. The thing that was happening was that I was overcoming some fears that I had. I was having to rationalize my fear of the dark and my fear of enclosed spaces. Um, and maybe I was thinking a little bit about why I had become so afraid of certain things. And then this one, this is a kind of nicer memory. So this is me and my doggy Duke. And that's him, I think he is probably about six weeks old there, very cute. And this was the first time that I went to see him. So I went to see the litter and his mum and, um, and I picked him up and I held him and he started licking my face and I just fell in love with him. Um, and he's, well, he's two and a half now, so he's um, very much part of my life. But this day was a really important day for me. And it was a day when I guess things changed because I was 
able to, um, you know, kind of take my best friend Duke onwards into my life with me. So it's a really happy day. Um, and as you can see, I'm looking pretty happy. So is he. And then the next event I have is this, uh, this is the Coney Island hot dog eating contest. Now, I was so excited. This is a photograph that I took of that, co that contest. And it was about three years ago. And I had always wanted to go to um, America on the 4th of July. Um, I thought it would be really cool. I knew that obviously it was a holiday and there might be really interesting things happening. Um, and I was in New York and um, I managed to get to Coney Island and Coney Island has historically done this amazing hot dog eating contest. And it was a bit of an event for me because um, I'd read about it and um, I'd sort of always thought this was such a, a crazy thing to do and it wasn't something that I'd ever witnessed before and I couldn't believe that I was there and I just remember it really vividly and it was um, just a really brilliant day really. So you can see from world events and life events that um, you know they can be quite extreme from the very personal overcoming fears to the epic of actually making advancements in, in, our, in, in um, space travel and in traveling to the moon. Um, so they go from the very small to the huge. And I guess what I'm really interested in is not so much how we get bigger, because I think sometimes when we're asked to um, look for what's happening in a play, what's happening in a story, is we try and look for the big things. And actually, what I want us to do is go even smaller, because the smaller we go, then the more detail we can work in. And then the more is happening always, all the time, on stage. So we don't just want the big stuff, we really need to be looking at the tiny, minute details. And I guess I'm calling this the theatrical event. So the theatrical event is going to be the most interesting thing that happens for the character in a given set of truthful circumstances. And I guess the important thing here is that it is your job to find the event. So you, as the actor or the writer or the director in this instance, you're gonna look for that event or you will have created that event. You know exactly what it is. And the event for me is like a hidden gem. So it's not on the surface. It's not the spoken word or the written word. It's the other thing. And it's not even really subtext. So it's not necessarily what people are not saying. It's quite a different thing to that. The theatrical event, in a way, is the thing that is happening in the space. It's the thing that you feel or you know is happening. I think it's what is the truth behind everything. It's what people want. It's what people don't want. And it's kind of what drives everything. And it's the thing that keeps the audience excited. The feeling that something is happening. Something is happening. Now, it's not always easy to see it, or you can sometimes mistake it for something else. It seems really obvious at first, but it's not actually the thing that you thought it would be. So your job is really to go beyond the surface and you have to excavate in order to do that. So I guess that sounds quite straightforward, doesn't it? We're going to excavate the text or the, or the spoken word we're going to find the event, which is the hidden gem. But how do I find the event? Well, it's so simple. You need to ask lots and lots and lots and lots and even more questions. And that for me is the trick to directing. And um, when you're the director, you're kind of, you're working between, you know, the whole team, you're working between the performers, between the writer, between the text, between the designers. And it's really your job to ask questions, to really think about those questions and to continue to ask them. By asking questions, you will find the detail. Now I'm gonna give you an example of this. So it's your turn. I've done a lot of talking, I know. And it's now your turn 
to think about this. So this is um, uh, the image from Our Day Out, which was a production that I directed at Curve. And um, I really loved working on it. It's a brilliant play by Willie Russell. Some of you might be studying it, uh, or it might be new to you. Um, if it's new to you, have a read of it. It's a lovely, lovely story. Um, and it's about a group of students from a school who go on a day trip. <clears throat> and you kind of see what they get up to on that day trip. And um, I want us to have a look at um, this moment, sort of towards the end of the play, actually. I want to um, have a look at a character called Carol. So Carol is a quiet student. Um, she's maybe someone who we don't notice so much. Uh, she seems to be well behaved. Um, she seems to be um, kind of getting on with her own thing. But we meet Carol towards the end of the play and she is standing uh, on the edge of a cliff looking out to the sea. And her teacher, Mr. Briggs, uh, sees her and runs up. He's really worried about her. And she says this to him. I'm not coming back. You tell Mrs. K she can go home without me because I'm stopping here by the sea. So within this, there's lots. So we've got character Mrs. K, who's one of her teachers, is a teacher who she really trusts, um, who she has a lot of faith in. Um, and Mr. Briggs, you know, throughout has been a little bit, well, just not very kind. He's always shouting at them. And I guess Carol just tells him, look, I'm not coming back. You know, I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back uh, with you. Go and tell Mrs. K. So we have this moment, this, this big moment for this character who hasn't really said a huge amount uh, in the play so far. Now, what I want you to do is we won't look at the whole line. We're just going to look at this idea of I'm not coming back. So we're going to say that. So say the words, I'm not coming back. Yeah, you saying it. And again. Go for it. Brilliant. Now, what I want to think about, I want you to start asking some questions here. We need to find the event. So on the surface, I'm not coming back. I guess we could say that Carol is saying she's not coming back. She's not coming back. Um, to where? Where is she not coming back to? We've got to start working this out in order to understand what the event is. So on the surface, the character tells the other character that they're not going back. Okay, that's pretty obvious. That is on the surface. That's just the soil. Where's the gem in this? How do we find the gem? How do we find the thing that is covered up? The thing that keeps us all on the edge of our seats. Now, I want you to think, so sometimes we can approach this from the outside in. So we can just play around with that text. So think about, I'm not coming back again, say it. And um, I'm not coming back, off you go. Nice. This time when we do it, what we're going to do is um, you're going to think about her having a real sense of determination. So she's really, really, you know, she's determined that she's not coming back. And you're going to say it with a huge amount of determination. Off you go. More determined. Really determined. You mean it. OK, great. Now, the next time we're going to do it, I want you to think about um, this being a frightening thing. So something that maybe Carol isn't that determined about. She's not really that certain about um, what she's saying here, but it just knows that this is the right thing for her to say at this time. This is what she needs to tell this teacher. Okay. Maybe not so confident. So think about that character not being as confident. I'm not coming back. That's all you need to say. Try saying it different ways, quieter, softer, louder, more uncertain. Play around with the text. Okay, so from the outside in, we can see that there are lots of different ways that you can say this line. There is a sense that um, the character could be very determined at, the, at this point in the story, which is why they're saying what they're saying, or they could be quite uncertain about it. So they could be nervous about what they're actually saying here. So this time, what I want you to think about is how do we work out what the most exciting thing to play is right here? And most exciting also means the most truthful thing, because we can tell when somebody means what they're saying. 
when you're in an audience, you know when someone is saying something that resonates or that makes sense to you, uh, that is logical, but also that gives you something to think about or something to feel. So let's have a little think about Carol. Let's ask some questions. When she says, I'm not coming back, where is back? What does she mean by that? Where is she going back to? When she says, I'm not coming back, what does she mean in terms of that? Does she mean to the bus, from the edge of the cliff, to her life, to her school? Or does she mean something else? Now we have to keep asking questions. Where is home? What is here? What's the difference between here and home? What can Carol see right now? Perhaps she's looking out at sea. So what can she hear? Seagulls, the sound of the waves. Let's keep asking questions and build the picture. Now, you could say, for example, that imagine you're just enjoying the sea. So look out to sea. Ah, you can hear the waves and you can hear the seagulls and it's quite blissful. I love standing by the sea. And you hear it and it's calm. And then all of a sudden you can hear this really annoying voice telling you to get back. And it really surprises you. So the blissful feeling that you had looking out at the sea and that beautiful image of the sea is now destroyed because someone's interrupting this moment of peace that you're having. And then imagine if that was a thing, then what would this line mean? I'm not coming back. It could come more impulsively. It could come because that person has shocked or surprised us. Maybe we don't really know what we're saying. So it asks, it makes us ask more questions. Does Carol know what she's saying? Has she thought about this? Is it something that she's contemplated before this moment? Has she been standing at the sea going, I don't wanna go back to my life? Or has this moment caught her by surprise and she just says this, she blurts it out. Now, all of these questions are leading to decisions about how we might deliver the text and the decisions that we might make as the performer. And there is no right or wrong way. You have to go with the decision that feels the best for you in that moment, that feels like the most interesting and truthful way of delivering this, so that something is happening all of the time. And we ask those questions all of the time. We don't take the surface value of that line, I'm not coming back, but we interrogate it, we excavate it to the point where we start to build a much bigger, bigger picture, not just of this moment and this scene and this text and this relationship, but of who this human being is. And remember I said at the beginning that we're looking at human stories and what it means to be human. So, the very last question here, in a way, for all of us, whenever we look at a character in this section, is to think about what does it mean to be Carol right now? What does it mean for her humanity? What is happening for her so that we find the truth in this moment? It's not just the case of going in this scene, Carol doesn't want to go back home, but what else is happening? So that something is always fizzing away in the scene. Now, it's often my job as the director to try and find those things with actors or to find those things with writers. But you can do that yourself in your exploration of the texts and of the kind of tasks perhaps that you're asked to do within your own studies. So, let's think about maybe how you use events. So there's something that's happening, identifying what's happening, not just in uh, texts or plays that you are already studying, but how do you use the event um, to create a new story? How can events help you? For example, when you are using the questioning technique to create your own stories. And that could mean, for example, there's the event at the center. We've looked a little bit at text analysis. So how we can use the given words or the spoken word 
to understand what might be happening. But also you can use this in other areas in your work in English and in drama. And also, you know, when you're actually looking at um, facts and things as well. So how do we use facts? How do we use questions? So this might be in devised work. So when you're creating uh, a new piece of work based on a stimulus, uh, usually with other people. Um, so you have an idea of what it is you want to make and what it is, maybe what the big questions around or the themes or the topics that you want to make. But actually understanding how you even begin that process can start with an event. We look, we can look at improvisation. So an idea that within the moment you might be asked, here's the circumstances, you're at a bus stop and this person comes along and they're holding a bag with a fish in, off you go. Okay, so what's the event here? Well, maybe it's the fish. So the event is the fish. Somebody's got a fish in a bag. Okay, so begin. Bef without identifying the event, maybe you can't really get into the improvisation. We just start saying a lot of words. Often in improvisation, we try and be funny because we think that that's um, gonna, you know, kind of make other people laugh. And by making other people laugh, they sometimes think that we're clever or that we've got, you know, a really uh, brilliant imagination. That can be true, um, but maybe think more so when you're stuck in an improvisation and you don't really know what to say, focus on what the event is. What is really happening? Don't worry about just saying words or just having a conversation. Having a conversation is not theater. The next thing that we have is script writing. So you may be asked to create a monologue. So a piece of text for one voice, maybe direct address to an audience or a duologue, so between two people, or you may be asked to write a scene. And often we get really stuck and we start thinking, well, where do I even begin to start creating this script? How do I write a monologue? How do I create a duologue? And one of the things I often say is, identify the event. What is the event? How do I create it? Now, this is easier said than done because I've shown you world events and I've shown you life events. And we've talked a little bit about kind of events that we might find in existing plays, but how do we create an event from nothing? And remember I said that it doesn't have to be the big thing, but we might be looking for the small thing, the tiny, tiny detail. Okay. So this is where your work begins. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to think of something that's happened to you today. When I say that, quite often you think, oh, nothing's happened to me today. I've literally woken up and um, had a shower, maybe. Um, I've walked downstairs. Um, I've done a bit of schoolwork, been for a walk, fed the chickens, whatever you end up doing, maybe watch some telly. These things, they're nothing. Had my breakfast. Hmm, had your breakfast, you say? Okay, interesting. Right, let's start with that as an event. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the tiny things as events. So, this is for you to do at home along with me. Now I'm gonna take an event like I had my breakfast. Okay, now if I go back to my morning, I went to get my breakfast cereal of choice this morning um, and I discovered when I got to the cupboard that it wasn't there. Hmm. So something was happening. Now on the surface, I tell you I had my breakfast but let's dig deeper. So what did you have for breakfast? Well, um, I had cornflakes. You had cornflakes, okay. Um, did you like them? No. No, there's something interesting there. Why didn't you like them? Well, I didn't like them because I don't normally have cornflakes because my breakfast cereal of choice, chocolate porridge, wasn't there. Okay, interesting. So I start to think about, well, why wasn't it there? I don't know. Um, I think maybe I might have eaten it all. You've eaten it all. Mm -hmm. 
okay, why did you eat it all? Well, because I was feeling a little bit worried and uh, makes me feel quite, um, well, it just makes me feel a little bit happier because it's really chocolatey and tasty. Okay, so how long has it made you feel like this for? Well, I've been eating this chocolate porridge for about 25 years. So probably 25 years is how long I have been enjoying this chocolate porridge. And this chocolate porridge, when I eat it, it kind of makes me feel quite comforted, really. Uh, okay, so why were you feeling worried? Well, I guess I was feeling worried because I had um, to write an essay. Uh, and um, I haven't written an essay for 15 years, that's a long time. And I was really worried about it not being very good. Um, so I was getting really anxious and so I wanted to eat the chocolate porridge um, and I hadn't realised how much I put in and actually I've ended up eating the whole box. So this morning, when I went to go to get my chocolate porridge and it wasn't there and I had to have the cornflakes instead, I wasn't just having my breakfast. In a way, I had remembered in that moment that I had eaten all of my chocolate porridge and I had eaten it for a very specific reason because I was feeling a bit worried. And then I had to have an alternative, which made me feel a little bit frustrated and not so satisfied, to be honest, because conflicts never quite do the job. OK, now maybe we can go a bit further with that, because I guess I could look into, I could question why I was worried about the essay that I had to write. I could think about all of the complex things that happen when we think about our own worries or our own anxieties. Um, and I guess really I'd probably find out that I didn't want to fail, um, that I wanted uh, people to be proud of me, um, that there were sort of very human reasons, very personal human reasons why this was so important to me. And so the event, which is what I'm going to name now, I'm going to name the event chocolate porridge disappearance. It's not the best title, but there are worse. So chocolate porridge disappearance. Now, I guess what we know is I actually know where the porridge has gone, um, but I'm not going to let you know that. Um, and it's much more deep rooted than that anyway. So what I want us to do is consider my event is on the surface, I had breakfast. The event becomes more exciting when I say chocolate porridge disappearance. Uh, the case of the disappearing chocolate porridge, even better. Okay, so what we've done there is we've taken a really very dull event, apparently boring everyday event, and we've made it into something more exciting. There is a deep psychological layer beneath it, but there is also the potential for a story. And we're able to do this because humans have got great imaginations. And so therefore we can take this incident, breakfast, the disappearance of the chocolate porridge into another realm. So when we're thinking about um, how we then go back to these ideas of what, how we use an event, um, then I'm gonna take you through how you might be able to do that for yourselves in order to help you with things like device work, improvisation and script work. Okay. Let's have a look. So how are we going to use the event that you've now created? The thing that you thought was really boring, actually the most exciting story you've ever heard of, chocolate porridge disappearance. What we're going to do now is have a look at it in these terms. So we've got the event here. We know that this one is called chocolate porridge. And I'm going to set you the task, first of all, of creating this into a news report. So you can do this in your own time. Um, but you can have a little look and I'm going to give you some examples of the difference between each of these things. So the news report, you know, uh, I might start writing breaking news. Uh, there has been an incident of porridge shortage in South Wales in a town called Llanelli, famous for its production of tin plate. And um, we could go into maybe the newsreader says, you know, our reporters on the scene um, and they have interviewed some key witnesses. 
And perhaps we get some key witnesses coming in talking about, well, you know, went to the cupboard and, um, you know, I thought there was going to be some chocolate porridge there, but it really wasn't there. Um, and before I knew it, I had to have cornflakes and it was quite a disaster, to be honest. Mm -hmm. We go back to the studio and we continue the news report about how this is something that's been happening all over the world and nobody can understand where the chocolate porridge has gone to. So the news report is kind of sometimes quite a, a great way into understanding how to make a story more sensational and um, because quite often on the news um, you know they try and find the most exciting thing that that particular story does um, and it also opens up ways that maybe we might go into scenes or we might go into wit eyewitness accounts um, and we, we kind of change voices so it's a really really quick way into making the event become something else so as an exercise you go from the event into creating a news report of that event. Now already you can see that the news report also gives you the option to think about scenes. So we've had the eyewitnesses and they've talked about their experience. So maybe now we could take a scene, for example. Um, maybe um, somebody says in the news report, you know, and I said to my mother, where is the chocolate porridge? What happened to it? Okay, let's flash into the scene. Okay, so we go into the scene. We have uh, a girl and her mum, and they're sitting together watching the television. And uh, the mum says something like, um, What are you eating? And the girl says, Cornflakes. I thought you didn't like cornflakes. I don't. I don't like cornflakes. I've never liked cornflakes. Okay, so you can see we're in into a scene here. It could go anywhere. We could get to this sort of very fundamental, exciting relationship between this mother and daughter within this conversation about cornflakes. Because there is something that's not being spoken. On the surface, we have, you don't normally eat cornflakes. I know, I don't like cornflakes. Underneath, we can find a whole lot more going on. Now, I guess what might be useful is then how we take that scene, maybe we might go from the scene into kind of a vlog approach. So I guess sometimes um, take, making the leap into monologue straight away can be a little bit daunting. We kind of go, where do I even begin? So a vlog, so, you know, a video log is like a diary entry, but it's more performative. So we're going to think about well, who's our audience in that? Who are we talking to? Are they our friends? Are they our allies, our confidants? Are they our enemies? Hopefully not. I don't think there's many chocolate porridge enemies in the world. Um, but maybe we're just thinking about, uh, you know, who are we saying this to? So in this instance, I'm gonna imagine that I'm speaking to other people who love chocolate porridge. And I'm gonna create a vlog based on that. So I'm gonna start that by kind of saying, you know, thank you so much for, continuing to follow me, follow me. Um, you know, today something really tragic happened to me. And when I went to the cupboard, um, I saw that there wasn't any chocolate porridge left. And I had to find an alternative, you know, I had to seek, seek out something else. And I was made to eat cornflakes. Now don't judge me on that, okay? Don't judge me. I really didn't have much say in it. All right, so. You can see how the vlog you know, has a rapport because we're thinking about who our audience is. We have a relationship with the audience in that instance. So imagine we turn our vlog into a monologue. So a single person uh, you know, in a play who is talking usually directly to an audience um, and they have to personalize in the same way. So they have to think about who that audience actually is. Um, so in the monologue sense, what we want really is something more dramatic in a way. Uh, we want to build the text so that it really feels like it belongs within a play. So what's our opening line? Well, try and think the opening line in a way has to propel us into something um, quite intriguing so that we hook the audience in. For example, when I woke up that day, I just had a feeling that something was wrong. Then we continue into our monologue. We go into walking down the stairs, floorboard by floorboard, 
And as I approached the cupboard and I opened it, I had a pang, a kind of gut feeling, a premonition almost, that everything was about to change. So you can see it just starts to kind of roll off the tongue. It feels quite dramatic. There's something else there. But we know that that's just the surface, that there's more going on. And it's our job to unravel that within the mom log. So I guess what I'm saying is, is that this exercise, when you're asked in the future to think about how do I devise or improvise or create something? Um, how do I actually make that happen from my own imagination? Does it have to be something epic? Does it have to be something life-changing? Well, not always, actually. There is something quite interesting and complex about the familiar and about something that is, um, you know, kind of closer to home. So let's recap on everything that we've done today. Okay, so remember, naming the event can be really helpful when thinking about how plays work. So event is the thing that we're excavating, we're finding it. It's not about who the characters are and what they want and all that kind of stuff. It's just naming what is actually happening in the space at that time. Now the event also tells us about the character and this can be useful for writers and performers. So not, not one or the other, but it can actually be a really interesting thing that we share. And sometimes it's really great to name it together. We have to look beyond the surface to find the most exciting event possible. There's no point just playing I had my breakfast. Let's go for the most exciting thing that we can find within that. Now, this is my number one. Theatre really shouldn't be boring. It should be absolutely fizzing with events so that the audience feel that something is happening all of the time. And remember that humans are so interesting. Even having your breakfast can turn into an epic play. So it's your turn. Have a think about play archaeology, excavating, finding that event and making everything you do really, really exciting. Good luck with it. And I look forward to seeing your work in the future. Thanks very much. <laughs>